You only wanted Jesus, but they sold you a Yahweh, and the difference is deadly. Deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. For many years, beginning most notably with the fake plague and the bioweapon injections, the forced march to death of Ukrainian Christians under the Zelensky regime, and more recently with the intensified ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the ever-dwindling number of Christians within it, something very unusual and very underreported has been going on. Now, some people would say, yes, Darren, I've noticed it too. It seems like Satan is growing stronger and his ancient cult and their manipulated apparatchiks have more power than ever. But you know, I actually think the opposite of that has been happening, or rather, an equal and opposite force for good has been stirred to action and is currently on the move. And of course, that force for good is our Father, our Christian God, as revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. But without context, I can see how that would appear to be counterintuitive as we look at a Western world that has devolved into a psychotic freak show and moralist cesspool of filth unseen since 1920s Berlin and Weimar Germany or the all-encompassing evil of the Bolsheviks from a hundred years ago. Of course, if you live in a city, you merely need to crack the door open to confirm what I'm saying. If not, even a casual glance at your television programs and commercials should do the trick. And yet, despite this very dark backdrop, I can assure you that our Father, through His Holy Spirit, is countering this evil in ways that you may not be aware of. And one of those ways is by the lifting of the blinding Yahweh veil from the eyes and minds of Judeo-Christians. The blinding veil that prevents them from seeing the deception foisted upon them. The blinding veil that allows the murder of children and genocide to parade right in front of them, yet they refuse to see it. Worse, they champion and defend it. Make no mistake, there is nothing of Christ here. But how can this be? How did this plainly obvious inversion of good and evil transpire? Now, before I get into this, it's important that you understand that nothing I'm about to explain to you is new or revolutionary. In fact, it was the dogma and doctrine of millions of the pre-Nicene Christians that preceded you. Christians that lived in the years and era just after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would dare say they knew a lot more about and were closer to the true faith than some grifting carnival barker on TV today dressed up in a preacher costume. Now, with that in mind, we also need to define a couple of terms. Number one, Judeo-Christian. What is it and how do we identify one? The simplest way is by looking at their Bible. Uh, is an alien religion stapled to the front of it? Well, those pages are cherry-picked from a much larger group of scrolls called the Torah from the Hebrew Yahweh religion. And late in the 4th century, they were stapled onto a heavily edited, almost unrecognizable version of the original Christian Bible. Then, in 382 A.D., this mixed collection of Hebrew and Greek papers, mainly from unknown authors, underwent a magical transformation and blending process before being presented to the world as a Bible written in Latin. You may know it as the Latin Vulgate, courtesy of St. Jerome. And after further translation into a form of Old World English, more than a thousand years later, we now know it as the King James Bible. But why would seemingly devout Christians and early church leaders abide by this alloyed religion? Now, the nearest we can guess comes from a quote from Bishop Eusebius, also known as the father of church history, who, along with Emperor Constantine, presided over the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, in which he is quoted as saying, it will sometimes be necessary to use 
falsehood for the benefit of those who need such a mode of treatment, unquote. Eusebius was also fond of using Plato's for the greater good as justification for adding Hebrew scrolls to the Bible. Now, the overall gist of it is that they felt they couldn't sell Jesus without a Yahweh and long-running Jewish history as a backstop. Today, we know that was a fatal mistake, or soon will be. More on that later. Number two, Yahweh. Now, Although they worshipped and sacrificed to many different gods over the millennia, including human and animal sacrifices to Baal and Chemosh, the Jews were monolatrous and eventually came around to deciding on a deity called Yahweh. Now, this Yahweh deity, as portrayed in their scrolls, orders Jews to commit genocide against entire races and tribes of people, sparing not even women and children, including those still in the womb, which, and I quote, should be ripped out and have a sword thrust through them. Now, a particularly charming quote comes to us from Ezekiel 9.6, in which the enraged Yahweh deity orders his cult members to, and I quote, kill them all, men, women, and little children, unquote. And more of these genocide quotes were made famous by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu recently when he quoted from some regarding Yahweh's hatred of some vague character named Amalek over 2,000 years ago as justification for his Gaza genocide. Now, according to Netanyahu's Torah scrolls, the Yahweh deity finds it necessary to do these things to ensure that his cult members are given special lands that he deems they are worthy of from time to time. Although, sometimes the Yahweh deity also becomes angry with his own cult and sends plagues of poisonous snakes to kill them, or it takes away their special lands. Basically, he's Charles Manson with a real estate license. So, does this mean that Yahweh is actually Satan? Well, if you take the quotes of Jesus in your Judeo-Christian Bible at face value, it's hard not to come to that conclusion. In fact, he says their father is the devil in John 8, 44, and explicitly tells the Jews, you do not know God, and God does not know you. And how did this Yahweh cult respond to being rejected by Jesus Christ himself? Well, frankly, not well. They tried to kill him multiple times, once by stoning, another by throwing him off the top of a cliff in Nazareth, and of course, finally, convincing the Romans to finish the job that they weren't allowed to do. And of more than passing interest is the fact that the name Yahweh appears 6,832 times in the Old Testament, but not even once in the New Testament. Nor does the name Yeshua. No, not even once. Number three, the very first Christian Bible. Now, this is the first Bible, and the one used by the pre-Nicene Christians and compiled in 144 AD. It consists of the Evangelion, or the Gospel of the Lord, and the Apostolicon, or the Apostle Paul's original ten epistles. And, like everything else back then, it was written in Greek, the same language spoken by Jesus and everyone else, including the Jews at that time in the Roman Empire. And there is no Old Testament or rehash scrolls from the Torah in it. No stories of two Jews in a Bethlehem horse stall. Nor is there anything called Yahweh within its pages. It was and is the foundational canon, doctrine, and dogma which was later vandalized to create the Judeo-Christian Bible of today. And I'll have a link in the show notes so you can download a free copy or you can Get it at theveryfirstbible.org and follow along with the rest of the episode. Now, believe it or not, all of this brings us back in a fairly roundabout way to the reason we're here, which is, what does this have to do with a blinding veil finally being lifted from the eyes and minds of today's Judeo-Christians? Well, let's dive right in and 
first talk about this veil and read the relevant verse associated with it from 2 Corinthians 3, 9 through 13. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Unquote. Now, I'm not sure what your takeaway from that was, but it sure didn't sound like a ringing endorsement of Moses and his horns, his Yahweh deity, or of his cult in general. But more to the point, their minds were blinded when they read the Old Testament. A veil is placed over their hearts. Now, exactly how dangerous are the sinful words and stories and deeds of Yahweh and his cult described in these alien scrolls? Well, apparently dangerous enough that they'll blind your mind and veil your heart as a genocide is paraded right before you. Were not the very words of the Yahweh deity and his Torah spoken by Netanyahu himself to serve as justification for mass murder? Is the light starting to flicker for you yet? Go ahead and tap it a couple times. It's probably been a while. Still nothing? Well, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Quote, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them." Unquote. Okay, tap it again. Now, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The Apostle Paul is referring to Yahweh here, in case you missed it. Not Jesus, not our Father, our Christian God. When Paul says the God of this world, he's referring to this Yahweh deity, the desert war god of the Jews and their blinding veil. Now remember, our Father does not seek to confuse us, or blind us, or delude us, or place a veil over our hearts and invert good with evil. You see, that's the realm of Satan or Yahweh or whatever unclean spirits you'd like to name. And sometimes a lie is so big, a deception so vast and long-running, that you miss the forest for the trees. You miss the genocide with twirling glow sticks, murdered children, and explosions as it passes right before your eyes. And how am I so sure about all this? Well... Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 14.23. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints, unquote. You see, it's very simple. Our Father and our first Christian Bible doesn't need an entire apologetics industry to make round pegs fit into square holes. He doesn't need gematria, secret numbers, Ouija boards, Talmudic magic tricks and red strings, talking fish and tarot cards. He didn't tell anybody to staple two different Bibles together and create a Frankenstein religion, which is half of one and half of another, naming itself Judeo-Christian and becoming neither. Why? For he is not the author of confusion. You see, the pre-Nicene Christians knew all of this before the Damnatio Memoriae, and now you do as well. In hearing what you have just heard and knowing what you now know, you should not turn back to the blinding veil of Yahweh and his earthly parasites which seek your physical and spiritual destruction. Do not be like the dog which returns to its own pool of vomit. Simply put, a seal has been broken, and God's Holy Spirit is on the move right now, lifting that blinding veil from billions of people. 
Bishop Andrew Theophilus of the Martianite Christian Church says, this is all now in the book and nothing can stop it. But conversely, Satan's parasites here on earth have never had this much unfettered power and control, and believe me, they don't intend to go back into the abyss quietly. They will use every lie, trick, and deception in Satan's toolbox to keep you veiled, blinded, and confused. And all will be affected by the coming division and battle, and all will have to make a choice in that day. But not all will see its completion on earth. Not all will see that night. Remember, the only way to the Father is through the Son and baptism. And if you're lacking in either, I suggest you rearrange your schedule. Let's read together the following prayer that has been provided by the Church for Judeo-Christians who suffer under the Yahweh derangement syndrome. It's called the Prayer for the Deceived. Our Father, reveal to us only through your Son, Jesus Christ, into your hands alone I commend my spirit. In my innocence I trusted, and the enemy of all mankind took advantage, leading me astray. Truly penitent, I now pray for your forgiveness. I now renounce and rebuke all that is not of Christ, and ask you to send your Holy Spirit for guidance and spiritual discernment. I pray your will be done. Amen. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on Pre-Nicene Perspective. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. And that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. 10 books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.